This is uh, Dr. John Adler, Emeritus Professor of Neurosurgery at Stanford University. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. In this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. John Adler, the Dorothy and TK Chain Professor of Neurosurgery and Radiation Oncology at Stanford University. Dr. Allard Scholar Interest Center on Translational Research, especially the development of new minimally invasive surgical approaches to a wide variety of intra and extra cranial diseases. He is best known for his work in stereotactic radiosurgery. Dr. Adler is widely credited with creating the field of image guided radiosurgery. His research has been instrumental in the treatment of tumors and other lesions involving the head and neck, spine, chest, abdominal, and pelvis. Dr. Adler is the author of more than 180 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters and named inventor on 12 United States patents. Dr. Adler has served or continues to serve as an editor for seven traditional peer-reviewed medical journals. In 2009, Dr. Adler started the online peer-reviewed medical journal and social network Curious.com and currently serves as its CEO. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we have Dr. John Adler. Doc, how are we doing today? Doing great, Matthew. How are you doing? Doing good. Thank you for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? My primary objective in residency was to survive. Um, uh, Residency is never easy, but I think it was particularly hard in uh, a generation ago, and and it was particularly hard where I was a resident at Harvard and the Brigham. And uh, in fact, I sought it out. It was kind of the Marines of, of neurosurgery. It was meant to be tough. Um, and so it was a very arduous time in my life and arguably the most arduous time in my life. Um, and so survival was number one. And I don't think I even gave much thought in early years into what kind of uh, neurosurgical career I was going to pursue. I ironically just never dawned on me. Uh, however, I was surrounded by academics and as are many residents. And so the first instinct for many residents is to think about an academic career. And it wasn't really only till towards the end of my career that I found an interest that was probably best pursued in academics. And that's when I started thinking most seriously about an academic career. So your experience during your fellowship? Uh, Yeah, the the experience in question did occur during a fellowship um, without a lot of really deep thought. Uh, I went to the Karolinska Institute um, in Stockholm and expected to do mostly a cerebral vascular surgery fellowship uh, because I needed to do a year of fellowship somewhere. Uh, And just thinking, isn't Sweden a nice place to spend a year? That was really the the deep thought that went into my decision making. Uh, But while I was there, I met uh, Professor Lars Lexell, the originator of uh, the field of radiosurgery and actually much of stereotactic uh, um, neurosurgery and, and arguably one of the handful of greatest minds in neurosurgery of the 20th century. And when I met him, my, my, he rocked my world, as I like to say, and he, he just had a perspective of what one might get out of a neurosurgical career. And then going through that fellowship, what was the mindset as you entered that first job search process and how did your perspective change in the beginning years of your career? Well, the minute I was introduced to the field of radiosurgery, I was convinced that it would be the future of much of neurosurgery. And, um, and I, I was convinced that even state-of-the-art neurosurgery 30 years ago, and I'll argue even today, is going to be deemed incredibly primitive uh, 100 or 200 years from now. But if you look at what neurosurgery is likely to look like, it's going to look a lot like radiosurgery. And I said, wouldn't it be cool to be in the ground floor of of several century revolution. And so I said, screw it. I'm going to dedicate my life, my career to driving and pursuing this field, uh, not realizing that how much I would end up driving it, um, thinking that there would be lots of compadres along the way. But hell, I said, I want to do radiosurgery. Now, one doesn't just do radiosurgery. And I'm mindful that I needed to have a, a neurosurgery practice on which to graft a radiosurgery practice. And that meant, um, you know, I became particularly involved in, in treating brain tumors. And what would you say were some of the keys to your success in your early career that allowed you to climb to the top of your industry? 
I would argue, I would turn it around. I'd say in many ways, uh, by the standards by which you're judging many careers, my early career was a failure uh, um, because I went to a VA. I was largely the VA. I was five days time in the VA. Um, and uh, I didn't have a very good clinical practice. Uh, I was not terribly busy. But that was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life because I had the time to, to go deep. And I would urge all your residents very differently than maybe others is to, don't measure your career where you are in the first three or four years. Measure your career by where you are in 25 and 30 years. Now, if you're on a bread line or something in the first two or three years and, and, uh, and your family is homeless, yeah, well, that's not what I'm suggesting, but that's usually not the, an outlook that a, a nurse, much a neurosurgeon, much less any highly valued specialist is looking at. So um, I had a, from the day one, I had a long ball perspective on what I was trying to do. Um, and the great irony is that my lack of great clinical productivity in my earliest few years enabled me to go very deep into the field of radio surgery and do things that other people could not. And by year 10, I was arguably the busiest neurosurgeon at Stanford. So it wasn't that it wasn't this, this long period of depravity. It was just a, a few years. But I, I really tried to build a foundation on which I could build a lifetime of neurosurgery contribution. Now, during your career, were you ever thinking about going private practice or were you academic focused all the way? Um, that's a really amazing question, and I think it's a, a topical question today. Um, so I did look at some very good private practices, uh, a few um, on the East Coast, and, uh, you know, it, it might have happened. It might have happened. Um, if I didn't have get as good a academic opportunity as I ended up getting, and I didn't even, even there, I was stupid how good it would ultimately be going to Stanford. Um, so I looked very seriously at, um, at private practice opportunities. And in those days, you know, 30 year, years ago, um, if you want to do something very creative and very imaginative, um, like I was aspiring to do, it was almost unthinkable that this might happen outside of the university. Almost unthinkable. However, I actually think the world has come full circle. And I find that there's less imagination in university and academics today. And, you know, if you're truly an innovative spirit, I think there's ample opportunities to do this now in a private practice world and probably more opportunities because academics has now become obsessed with conflict of interest. And there's all these petty jealousies trying to tear people down. And I find that it's less true in the private practice world. So I think the most innovative medicine today is being driven in a, a private practice environment and an ambulatory surgery world where you don't need big, big hospitals. And so um, I, if I was leading practice today, I would think I would have chosen a different path. Now, one thing that we're hoping to explore here is the entrepreneur mindset that you have, something that I don't, don't think really gets talked about that much among the surgeon community. And so what type of advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows going into that job search process for the first time, taking into consideration your entrepreneurial mindset and knowing what these residents go through? Well, I, I'm an entrepreneur to my core, and I believe that entrepreneurship is a useful tool throughout all of life. And I don't, I don't believe that there's any dimension of life that can't have benefit from an action of an entrepreneurial spirit. So even if you go into academics, there's ways to start new programs or there's start, you know, not for profits. Um, but certainly in the private practice world, there's even more opportunities for an entrepreneurial flair. And I say, do it with all your gusto. And um, you the, really entrepreneurs are just there to reimagine the world. I mean, people have pegged in their brain that entrepreneurship is about money. No, I mean, money is a tool, a very important tool for making entrepreneurial ambitions real. But if, if it becomes the end game of your entrepreneurship, you're better off being an investment banker. So what I do suggest is that, you know, approach 
anything you do in life with an entrepreneurial perspective and reimagine how to do it better. And I think that that's why the private practice world, the non-academic world, which is far less regulated, far less restricted, has more opportunities for entrepreneurship, whether they be simple things like building an MRI scan in the, com scan in the community or something and you know, helping image your patients better, for example, um, or really to building a new technology company the way I did. Now, speaking on that, your name is very well known for the invention of CyberKnife. Can you please take us through the genesis behind that, how you developed it, where you are today, and kind of the ups and downs that you went through creating your own company? Uh, well, that's a multi-hour interview onto itself. Um, and a totally unfair question, Matthew. But um, the upshot was that um, when I worked with Lexell at the Karolinska Institute, I and believed that I was seeing neurosurgery for the next couple hundred years, in the early stages, albeit, um, I said, I want in. And, uh, and so for me, it became, a, being an entrepreneur, it became a logical question is, you know, what's next, you know? Um, and there were some intrinsic limitations to what my mentor Lexell had created, the, uh, most uh, concretely the stereotactic frame. And so I envisioned a world where we didn't need stereotactic frames and one could do radio surgery anywhere in the body. And, uh, it, you know, it dovetailed with uh, the evolution of computers and better imaging algorithms. And even though I didn't have a hardcore technical background, I understood enough to work with technologists to dream up and then make a, a image guided radio surgical system, which became the cyber knife. Um, and when I tried to do that inside a, a, an academic environment by, you know, getting government grants and that kind of stuff. And I mean, it's just too constrained and the NIH, God bless them. It's not really about creating disruptive, innovative technologies. It's, it's more about understanding some basic science that may or may not have, you know, application in the real world in the next 50, even a hundred years, who knows? Um, and I'm, I'm not here to dismiss what the NIH does. It does important stuff. But if you really want to change the world in the next decades, few decades, it isn't going to happen through the NIH. And so you have to turn to, you got to go find money somewhere because this was kind of expensive stuff for the research. And then you, the logical thing is you go to big companies and, and big companies, um, all they can see past is the next couple quarters. And, you know, <laughs> if you have a way to, help them improve the bottom line of, you know, Q3 of next year, they're all over you. But if you really have an idea that's going to take five to 10 years to develop, you're not going to get help. And so you're really stuck doing what we do in Silicon Valley. We start companies. And, uh, and so that's what I chose to do. And it's, it's clearly my nature to, to not be fearful about the idea that one would take five or 10 years. And so I eventually made the cyber knife. It was a very, very, very difficult startup. I, I was dumb and naive and didn't know much, surrounded myself by people who really weren't the most useful to me at the time. Uh, but it worked and the technology is fundamentally strong and powerful and uh, I'm proud of what it's done. It's treated, you know, more than a million patients. Um, and I would argue that, you know, every year, a million, two million patients a year get treated with the principles of the CyberKnife. But the failures of the cyber knife led me to do my next company. You know, what did I get wrong in that business, which was mostly not scientific, but more understanding the way the real world works in terms of money and power, control and regulations. And that eventually led to my current startup that I've uh, been managing now for the last six years called uh, Zap Surgical. And Zap Surgical is doing great stuff. So that's great. Now, can you also tell us about your creation of Curious and, and where you see it going, how you decided to start that and how you're really getting that name out there to the other surgeons? Well, um, as an academic, um, publishing, scholarly publishing was an integral part of my career. That's how I build my career. I mean, there, at some point I was, as I said, the busiest, if not the busiest surgeon at Stanford, and it was built off the many publications that were showcasing the innovative procedures I was doing at Stanford. And that had application not only directly to the procedures themselves, but also related procedures. And so I believe that the most legitimate way for any doctor to build their career, build their referral base, is to 
publish in academic, publish in peer reviewed journals. Uh, what these journals do is they showcase your abilities. And so that's the purpose of most journal publications for most high value specialties. I mean, there's the NIH basic science publication, which is here to change the world in 50, 100 years. But if you want to um, show surgeons and other high value specialists how you deliver outstanding outcomes for your patients, peer reviewed journals are what it's about. And so um, that's how I built my career. And yet I found it was incredibly cumbersome to do this. Um, it was incredibly slow uh, and it turns out very expensive. You know, there's paywalls around the vast majority of journals. They're controlled and owned by, you know, the Nature Group and Elsevier, New England Journal of Medicine. And, and they're, they're big businesses and people don't realize it, but they're multi-billion dollar businesses with multi-billion dollar profits and some of the highest margin businesses anywhere in the world today, more, more high margin value than uh, Facebook. So, um, and I said, damn, but this is expensive. It's slow. It's broken. You know, can we do better? And so I have a son who's an entrepreneur and he kind of dabbled in this space for you know, a week and then decided that was much too grown up and went on to be very successful in his own little um, publishing startup uh, called Scribd. Um, so, uh, but I said, hell, my dumb son can do this. Maybe even I can do it because he kind of incubated this in our living room uh, with some friends. Uh, so I said, well, I'm going to give it a shot. And so with a, a colleague in Munich, Germany, another neurosurgeon, you know, we ponied up a little bit of our own money and then eventually raised additional money. Uh, we started from scratch, um, trying to fix the publishing industry for medical journals. Uh, you know, Harvard came to me and asked me, the astrophysics department wanted me to fix, you know, fix, you know, astrophysics. And I said, no, I understand medicine. And I think the moral model, the model we're developing, business model works in medicine because as I've already implied, so much of the reason we publish as surgeons is to drive our individual surgical brand, drive, uh, exp explain to the world what our surgical capabilities are through the peer reviewed process. And so that's really what Curious is. It's a new generation journal ending, intending to streamline and accelerate the generation and curation and then ultimately dissemination of medical knowledge. Um, and break down, by breaking down the paywalls, we open up a lot of huge new vistas of readers because historically, the only people who read like an orthopedics article were other orthopedists. But I believe that there's really a huge vista of patients who are interested in reading and finding great doctors for themselves and their family. And that that's where, in the end, many more of the readers of the future of journals may come from the general lay public. So um, Curious has been disruptive to the traditional model, growing very quickly. We've been growing almost 100% every year now for five, six years. Uh, you know, we'll do over 5,000 articles this year. And I really believe that ultimately we can be the Facebook of medical journals and really, really literally be publishing millions of articles a year and that there are huge numbers of clinical stories, very clinical stories that are untold yet have in aggregate incredible value for society you know, thought experiment, you know, I have a little problem with my knee and I think, well, you know, do I go see an orthopedist? Do I get an MRI scan? You know, what, what is the future of this knee going to be like? Well, you know, the truth is the world really doesn't know because, you know, there's it, somebody somewhere has taken a thousand knees and, and, and looked at them and decided, you know, 20% requires surgery and 5%, you know, get better by themselves or whatever. My implicate, my point is, would it be nice to find, um, to identify 10 other John Adlers, you know, sort of 66 year old guys with a knee like mine who has a certain imaging characteristics who, you know, isn't diabetic or whatever. And, you know, do I need surgery on my knee now or what's going what's the likely going to be in the next five or 10 years? I think there's, if we get more and more and more granular with medical knowledge, we can answer almost any question in healthcare by collecting a huge repository of medical knowledge. And, but to be, get to do it, it needs to be far more economical, far fewer, far less friction. And Curious intends to do that. And nothing exists like that today. And so someday my view is there'll be one-stop shopping. You have a question about medical knowledge, you're gonna to go to Curious whether you're a doctor or whether you're a patient or insurance company or a hospital. So, and in the 
And in that mix, there's lots of opportunities to kind of make money. And to think about that topic, it's it's difficult for specialty surgeries from a patient's perspective as far as figuring out what surgeon should they go to, you know, reviews about that surgeon, the cases that they've done. You know, how do you see that market where it is right now? I understand your platform can be a big help for that, but what really, what do patients do in order to get that intel and how can we fix that? I mean, a brilliant question. And it's so self-evident to me that this is an important question, yet our society just kind of glosses over it. And, you know, you, I guess you open your insurance booklet and you say, I have access to, you know, these 10 plastic surgeon orthopedists and I'm going to eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Uh, but what happens if this is life-saving, you know, heart surgery or brain surgery or even a, a redo, redo, you know, hip in some, you know, complicated situation? I mean, patients know nothing. And in fact, physicians are not that much better, uh, sad to say. But if you were to ask me, you know, who's the go-to neurosurgeon, you know, in Atlanta or, you know, Washington, D.C., well, I would see, go back and see who's published in the medical journals and see what they publish and whose publications demonstrate expertise that's closely aligned with the surgery operation that needs to be done. And that would be my best pick, my best guess at who should be the go-to neurosurgeon in that case. So um, I see Curious is potentially filling that role. I would suggest that in 10 years, you won't ever have a complicated high value procedure before finding somebody who has the requisite expertise uh, and demonstrate it in a peer reviewed way uh, to be your doctor. And Curious tends, tends to you know, plug that hole, serve that function. It's been a very meaningful life to be an, uh, a surgical entrepreneur, entrepreneurial surgical, whatever you want to call me. Um, but it, it isn't for everybody. But for those it is, um, give me a call. If you're the right stuff, I'd love to work with you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.